Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyzing Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. In this episode, I sit down with Peter Harsha, the Director of Government Affairs for the Computing Research Association, an organization which represents 200 North American academic departments of computer science, computer engineering, and related fields, 26 industrial research labs, and six affiliated professional societies. In his position, Peter works to help CRA influence computing research policy by improving public and policymaker understanding of the nature of research and by increasing the computing community's awareness of and participation in policy issues. In this episode, he discusses his experience working for Congress, the federal funding environment for science research, and his work with CRA and CCC programs, including the Leadership and Science Policy Institute and Congressional Fly-In. Enjoy. So we're here with CRA Director of Government Affairs, Peter Harsha. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Can you give like a little bit of background about how you first got involved with CRA and uh, your history with the organization? Sure. This is my 18th year that I've been uh, working for CRA. Prior to that, I was a member of the professional staff for the House Committee on Science, and I worked for the Subcommittee on Research, which had, as part of its portfolio, oversight over the whole uh, networking and information technology research and development program. So I was really familiar with the IT research and development portfolio, and so when I decided I no longer wanted to work 80-hour weeks for very little pay, um, (laughs) joining an organization (laughs) like CRA seemed a really good fit at the time. And it turned out to be a great fit because, like I say, I've been here uh, 18 years now. Right. And uh, really enjoying my time. Okay. So prior to your work on the Hill, how did you get involved with technology and policy? Uh, it was kind of a, a serendipitous path. I grew up in Southern California. I was a pretty wonky kid. I really liked politics and in an area that was fairly progressive, fairly liberal, I was a pretty conservative kid. And so I had the Reagan Bush, you know, bumper stickers on my <laughs> high school notebooks and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, but I was also the kids of, of parents who were very scientifically minded. My dad's an engineer and my mom was a, a biologist. So I felt like I was the science skips a generation or something. I, I knew how to speak science, but I didn't do science or anything. I went to a fairly politically connected school for college in Michigan, a tiny little liberal arts school, and ended up getting an internship with our local representative there in Washington. That became a full-time job. And then while I was still in school and my wife was in graduate school, I worked in his district. So I got to know what district politics was really like and how crazy the concerns of constituents can be. And then out of pure luck, he sort of became the uh, default chair of the subcommittee on research for the House Science Committee. And all committee chairs, when they get to the position, believe every member of Congress believes they're uh, they're like one staffer away from being Speaker of the House. If uh-huh. only they had that super staffer, <laughs> like the PhD who knows politics inside out, knows all the players on the Hill, can make him a, you know, a real player in the space. And I wasn't that guy. Uh, but when he couldn't find that guy, I said, you know what? I could probably help out a lot on the science committee for you because I can speak science and I can also communicate reasonably well. Wait, so they they all think they're a staffer away from they being all, the speaker of the house? Every member of Congress believes in the back of their minds that they are probably one really solid staffer away from becoming speaker of the house or president or governor of their state or wherever if they could just isolate. So every hiring practice on the Hill uh-huh. becomes this exercise in trying to find the super staffer. I would not have thought that that would be contingent on finding one staffer. It, it, it isn't. In reality, <laughs> it is not. <laughs> there are so many other factors at play. But that's the easiest thing I guess they can control for. Right. So, okay. you know, they, otherwise they have to fix their own personalities and <laughs> politics and, and fundraising and all that sort of stuff. But uh, there are some really, really fine staffers out there. But um, like I say, my, my boss at the time couldn't find one of those. Okay. <laughs> so he picked, he picked me to go up there. So we moved out to Washington and I worked for the science committee for a few congresses and it, it was a pretty heady job. So I guess a lot of people listening to this probably don't have a lot of experience in DC or know what it's like to work on the Hill. Can you talk a little bit about what your day-to-day life is like if you are a congressional staffer and how that it's plays out? It's pretty crazy. It's, I mean, it's, um, it's crazy in a couple of different dimensions. So First of all, it's a it's a crap job in the sense that you work like 60 to 80 hours a week and you get paid a pittance because part of what 
members of Congress like to do, especially on the conservative side, is tout how little they spend uh, taxpayer dollars in their offices, and that includes for salaries. Right. So, um, so you generally start off as like an intern working for free, although that's changing now. M more internships are being paid on the Hill, which is great. Um, but I started working for free. But the payoff for working for free is that you get access to this world of people and information that's just amazing. The fact that Congress has this power to impose regulations on people or laws means people call you back. So as an intern in college uh, being told, ah, I get the president of the New York Stock Exchange on the phone, I want to ask him a question. And being able to have that phone call return, like really? sitting at your little intern <laughs> desk, which is like a three-quarter size version of a regular desk, right. um, and having someone tell you, uh, Peter, the president of the New York Stock Exchange is on the line for you, is pretty heady. Yeah. Um, and so as you move from the personal offices, which are mostly about serving constituents and working on the members' particular priorities, to the committee staff, which is where actual legislation gets written and passed and, you know, moved through the process, it gets even more interesting and more exciting because, number one, you have access to the best people in the world. You can call upon anybody and they'll give you their advice or their input. But you actually get to write stuff that becomes law, which scared my mom <laughs> you know, but the first bill, the first bill I ever had anything to do with this was a bill for the United States Fire Administration, which is not a hugely consequential agency, but um, it was my piece of the portfolio. And um, so it got signed and the President Clinton at the time signed it. And so I got to call up my mom and say, hey, I got my first bill signed. And she went, they're letting you write bills now? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, that's kind of my job now. Do they know you're an English major? <laughs> yes, yes, mom. That's so, the key skill, writing, right? It, it, it totally is. Uh, that's, I mean, that's what got me sort of my job. And I think most of the people you'll find who have successful careers on the Hill and off the Hill are just, they tend to be good communicators or try to be good communicators. Like I say, I went from that committee job, which I liked a lot because it combined the really wonky part of things, like understanding who the players are in the political space and what sort of inputs drive the process and change things and who's up for which chairmanship and how that's all going to play out. It combined that with the, the tech policy stuff that I really like too, the real geeky side of things. And in a way, the job here with CRA has continued that. I get to talk to the smartest people in the world about where technology is going. And I still get to kind of play in that political space too and understand the intersections between technology policy and and um, politics and where the technologies that our institutions and our members are producing, how they run up against regulations or run up against funding issues. So uh, it's a really exciting place to be right now. Yeah. So we'll dive deeper into the funding question in a second, but I guess going kind of uh, schoolhouse rock <laughs> Class 201, can you explain sort of how a bill gets written? Sure. Let's talk about funding bills because that's um, that's a more regular process. So you have a bill that gets developed in the House. It sets funding levels for particular agencies. We can talk about how all those bills are divided up. But basically, there are 12 bills that fund the entire federal government. Mm -hmm. And so every federal agency that gets discretionary money uh, appears in one of these bills. Um, and it's Congress's job to pass them every year. They don't do a great job of that. Um, and that's why we end up in shutdowns and all sorts of stuff like that. But it's their job to start. So the House will introduce a bill for an appropriations bill. It'll be the, the subcommittee chair for that particular appropriations committee. So for science agencies, the one we care a lot about is the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Bill, because that includes funding for NSF and NASA and NIST and NOAA. The chair of that committee will introduce the version of the bill. The committee will then, all the committee members get to mark it up. So they'll have a a markup session will everybody gets to add their input to it. Um, amendments are made. Uh, language is changed in the bill. The committee will vote that out of its subcommittee. The full committee takes it up, does the same process again, marks it up. It's usually a little quicker in the full committee. Uh, it'll pass out of the full committee. Um, and then it goes to the House floor. Whole House gets to vote on it. Same process. Members can make amendments to it. Appropriations are kind of a zero-sum game because there's a limited pot of money to spend. And once money is in a, an, an appropriations bill, if we think, say, the National Science Foundation didn't get enough money in that bill, if we want to see them get more money, we have to find a place elsewhere in that bill to take money from to give it to the National Science Foundation. Okay. So that means the National Science Foundation finds itself in competition with other science agencies, but also the Department of Justice, the Census Department, all sorts of stuff, which makes for really strange arguments sometimes. But if the whole House approves it, the Senate takes up its version of the same bill, does the whole same process on the Senate side. If it passes in the Senate, they reconcile the two different bills in what's called a conference committee, mm -hmm. where members from both 
uh, chambers sit down around a table and horse trade on what provisions that are different in the bill get included. They end up with a compromise bill that both chambers then approve. If they approve it, the president signs it, and away we go. We have funding for that particular agency. What's happened recently, at least in the appropriations process, is at some point in that process, whether it's the Senate passing the bill or the House and Senate agreeing on a conference agreement or the president agreeing that they're going to sign it, it breaks down. Right. And we end up with a government that doesn't have funding for particular parts of it as long as that bill is unfinished. And that's why we had our last 35 day shut down. Okay. So. So you just explained how sort of a funding bill gets passed. Can you talk sort of about how different funding agencies prioritize different kinds of research or different kinds of funding? I'm sure a lot of our listeners are applying for NSF grants or maybe DARPA, maybe NIH. So Yeah. So there are lots of different inputs into that kind of prioritization process. So there's the grassroots part of that, which is agencies are res responsive to their constituencies. So in the case of NSF, ideas that come from the community get addressed in the prioritization process at some point. There are other mission agencies that are focused on serving a particular community like veterans or uh, solving particular problems like health. And there are advisory sort of processes within there to let the community that they serve put input into the process. But there's also top-down prioritization, too, which comes from both the administration, which oversees all the agencies. That can come from, in the case of the science agencies, a place like the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is where the advice to the president sort of lives in the executive branch. And they can prioritize certain areas of research, like, for example, the most recent guidance memo that came out from OSTP prioritized a number of different science areas, including artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and advanced manufacturing and quantum science and 5G and other things. But the agencies take that advice to heart, both in part because it's well considered and they should, uh, but also because ultimately the agencies are going to have to submit their budgets to the White House Office of Management and Budget, which will have the final say in what each agency gets to put in its budget. And so if the agencies are not being responsive to OSDP and OMB, the agencies will find their budgets amended. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so those are two sources, but there are also obviously Congress has a role to play in, in this as well. Congress can weigh in formally either with legislation or report language that directs agencies to do particular things and prioritizes particular things. But they could also do it a lot less formally too, just by holding hearings on the issue and mm -hmm. kind of bringing in members of the agency uh, or uh, assistant directors or program managers and asking questions about why they're funding the things that they fund. And perhaps giving them advice on what they ought to fund instead. Okay. Uh, and that happens quite a lot too. So lots of different inputs. And it's really up to the agencies themselves to prioritize those inputs and figure out what the priorities for the agency would be. But in general, they really have to serve their mission. The agencies are chartered for a particular purpose. National Science Foundation is kind of interesting in that it's the only one that's chartered expressly for the advancing the progress of science. Okay. So um, they have a kind of a broad mission, but DARPA has the mission of preventing technological surprise in terms of national security in the military. NIH has a health-oriented mission and so on and so forth. So. so I guess what funding priorities have you seen change a lot over your career? Like obviously AI is a big hot area right now. What was AI 15 years ago or maybe it was well, AI still is AI? An, <laughs> AI is an interesting one because AI has had multiple cycles. Right. Um, generally, everything has a cycle. And so every major technology that we would think of as part of the IT economy right now probably had its moment in the sun in terms of budget priority at some point. I mean, that's not universally true. There are some that maybe have snuck through. But in the, like I say, the 18 or 20 years or so that I've been kind of working in this space, it's been everything from networking technologies to uh, supercomputing to big data to AI, quantum um, who knows where we're going from there? I mean, it could be thermodynamic computing. It could be who knows. Yeah. But for the most part, Congress and the agencies, I don't want to say they're a totally lagging indicator on that sort of stuff. But when you see something getting a priority, it usually means that there's already a great sort of center of effort around that particular technology. There are a lot of people working in that area because there has to be a certain level of noise reached in the area for Congress and the agencies to really pay attention, I think. There are a few agencies that are really forward-looking like DARPA and NSF and um, some others. But for the most part, they tend to be a little bit more responsive. So 
I guess sort of from a staffing perspective, what would you recommend in terms of staffing on the Hill to better be able to respond to emerging technologies? At AAAS, a couple of weeks ago, uh, David Mussington from University of Maryland made the point that a lot of career government officials don't have a science background or therefore unprepared to sort of evaluate, in this case, cybersecurity issues, mm-hmm. but that could be applicable to a lot of things, quantum computing, et cetera. So... Yeah. Well, I mean, so that's a big challenge for Congress. Getting technical advice into Congress, trusted technical advice, is a real problem because I mentioned the pay scales on Congress. They're not great. Right. Um, anyone fairly decent in the computing area has probably got a pretty good deal somewhere. <laughs> um, so it is difficult to entice people to come and spend time in D.C., especially in policymakers' offices or serving in agencies. I mean, not only is it a hit to the pocketbook, but in a really competitive field like computing, you know, taking a year or two out of your research career, especially if you're pre-tenure, can can derail you. So I think in that sense, we've kind of undertaken some efforts to raise the temperature around an appreciation for policy in the computing space with stuff like uh, our Leadership and Science Policy Institute program, which um, the, our Government Affairs Committee runs in conjunction with CCC. And the the, the idea here is to kind of sensitize a, a cadre in the community to the importance of science policy and to create a real understanding of how science policy gets made in the hope that once they graduate from there, they can take their skills, maybe not as a, on a permanent basis to D.C., but take advantage of sabbatical years or whatever to put in time in a congressional office or maybe at an agency, maybe even a traditionally non-science agency, like one of the mission agencies like Federal Trade Commission or somewhere where they desperately need technical advice to understand all the dimensions of the problems that they're facing in the regulatory space. I mean, it's a it's a real challenge. There are a number of other programs out there that are trying to address it too. AAAS is a long-standing science fellowship program, right. uh, science policy fellowship program that that places people in congressional offices. A lot of those science policy fellows never leave D.C. Really? Um, yeah, they come out and they enjoy the policymaking process enough that they stick around. Um, we used to joke that they were all life scientists who otherwise would be <laughs> doing postdocs for the rest of their life. And that's in part a little bit true. But um, but there are other efforts like uh, there's a new program called Tech Congress. Okay. I think that looks for um, sort of fellowship applicants and then we'll place them in congressional offices, specifically in the kind of the computing areas, which is – New, and they've had a reasonable amount of success at finding people who are willing to do it. But it's true, the the better advice that we can get into Congress, hopefully the better legislation and regulation that results right. um, from it. So it does behoove us as a citizenry to get our technical people engaged with policymakers. Yeah, so you brought up LISPI, which uh, I guess CCC sponsors and government affairs runs. So can you talk a little bit about that program and if people are interested in applying or... Absolutely. So LISPI is a uh, one and a half day workshop. It's sort of, we call it like Civics 601 instead of Civics 101. It's really about how federal science policy is made, kind of the, the real meat meat of the sausage making process that's a horrible metaphor but anyway the uh uh the ins and outs we have folks from uh the white house we have folks from uh federal agencies we have uh, folks from congress all sort of share their expertise on how the priorities are set how the process itself works like where are the inflection points in the process that you can have influence um, we also have folks like me who are kind of science advocate professionals who can help you discover sort of the best ways of crafting your particular story or your ask for it. And we even do kind of a a murder board where we have three folks set up to listen to pitches from the participants at the workshop and get real-time critique. It's sort of an American (laughs) Idol-ish kind of approach to three judges who listen to your pitch and and tell you honestly what we think about it. Simon Cowell in this metaphor? I I think I'm Randy Jackson. (laughs) I do a lot of, you know, yo, what up, dog in it. But uh, uh, it's that tends to be the highest rated part of the workshop because it's a real practical experience. And the three folks who we usually have do it, we're all former congressional staffers, so we've heard a thousand of these pitches. So it, it tends to be really useful in kind of honing that muscle, which maybe you don't use so much in your academic life, but uh, maybe you ought to be good at it because if you want to become a leader in the field, you need to understand how to sell this part of your research. It's not all about advocacy and salesmanship. It's a lot about understanding the process too. 
But being able to communicate your work to, say, your neighbor, to communicate the importance of it as if you just took 30% of his paycheck to pay for it is a really important skill, and it will serve you well in other parts of I argue, your academic life. It will certainly help you write better grant proposals if you think about your research in those terms. Right. In addition to LISPI, there's also the Congressional Fly-In Program, which is twice a year. Is that correct? Well, we, so we do one for our board members in February, and then, yeah, we do a kind of a general membership one in September. Um, this is a great opportunity for uh, folks that are member institutions to come on, out on their own dime and make the case for computing research in Washington to the generally to members of their own congressional delegations. So you'll meet the people who represent you in D.C. The importance of this particular event is not necessarily that you're out there asking for money. It's more that you're trying to make yourself known to those offices and trying to get to know those offices so that there's a relationship there that can be counted on in the future. Right. And those relationships play out in really interesting ways. It's, it's impossible to predict in advance how it will work out, but they can result in somebody being invited to testify at a hearing because they know that this great person in their district understands computer science. Um, or it could mean uh, an invitation to go serve on an advisory committee somewhere, like a federal advisory committee. It could also just mean asking for help on how to program their web page or <laughs> all sorts. I mean, the, the, uh, the needs are, are vast in, in congressional offices. And like I say, it's impossible to predict the outcomes of any of these meetings, but they're all generally positive. And um, we've gotten, I mean, reasonably rave reviews from the people who participate in them. And we get a lot of repeat visitors to it. But anyway, it's a, what we will do is we will uh, train you up. So uh, come out the, the afternoon before and we'll do a one-hour orientation session with everybody. We'll give you sort of the materials that you would use in that visit, the talking points and any uh, charts and graphs we want you to show. Uh, then we will ply you with food and alcohol so you are in a great mood for the next day <laughs> where you'll have a series of meetings, generally three to six meetings that we will set up for you. Um, and uh, give you all the important details about. And then you'll just go up and really make the case for computing research by really just talking about the stuff that you're already doing at your own institutions, uh, talking about that relevant, the relevance of that work to um, the, you know, the country and the, the world and how important the federal contribution to that research really was. So having gone to a couple of LISPs myself, I know a key part of the sales pitch is the tire tracks diagram, which oh, was yes. uh, from a National Academies study. I mean, I guess podcasting is not a visual medium. so No, we can't. Uh, let me show you the chart here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for people who are unaware about of this, can you sort of explain? Describe it. Oh, this will be good. Trying to visually describe it and then i guess where people can find this yeah so uh the first thing is you should go you could go to the government affairs website which is uh, cra.org uh, slash gov affairs um and under there there's an advocacy tag and on the advocacy page you'll see about three quarters of the way down the page a link for the tire tracks chart and other congressional visits state chart and it's called the tire tracks chart because there's a whole bunch of series of lines uh with arrows and things that go back and forth but basically it's a timeline and it tries to take the IT economy and divide it into a whole bunch of different subfields. And for each subfield, like AI and robotics or dat, big data, or I can't remember all, microprocessors, um, it traces the development of that area along three different lines. The first one is when work in that area was being done uh, in U.S. universities, uh, largely funded with federally with federal money. The second line is when work was going on in industrial research labs, um, generally with private sector money. The third line starts as a little dotted line when the first product in that space was introduced, so when it became a commercial product. Then the line turns solid when that becomes a billion dollar sector of the, the IT economy, and then it becomes double thick when it becomes a $10 billion sector of the IT economy. And so this chart is littered with these lines showing a lot of things, but mostly um, making the case for basic research for us, which is essentially research often takes a long time before it pays off, especially fundamental research. And, and you can see it all over the chart that research at U.S. universities in an area often started 10, 15, 20 years before the first product was introduced in the space. It also shows that research um, between U.S. universities and industry, they're of a different character. They're they're, um, they don't supplant one another. Work in U.S. universities tends to be much longer range. Like I say, it could be 15, 20 years before uh, something pays off in the space. On the industry side, it tends to be geared more towards product cycles. So maybe two product cycles ahead, maybe three product cycles ahead. And it also shows that the real sort of vibrancy in this 
ecosystem that the chart describes is in the flow of people and ideas between all these different areas. So uh, universities breed people in these areas that go to industrial labs. Industrial labs send people back and ideas back to uh, U.S. research institutions uh, for problems that need solving. And there's a fair amount of serendipity involved. So you'll see arrows that jump from one area all the way across to another, often serendipitously. The innovations in one space completely re-energize another space. And you see that all over the chart as well. The other aspect of the chart, which if I was showing it to you, I would point out, <laughs> is at, the very, at the very top of the chart is a whole list of uh, companies. You'd recognize every one of them, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, that are sort of roughly aligned above the subsectors that they emerge from. And the point there is just pretty obvious that these companies owe a lot of the innovation that develop the products that define them um, to this vibrant ecosystem, which has at its core federal support for research right. in it. So we argue that the chart shows that basically every innovation, every you know change to the U.S. standard of living, everything that I information technology has has done for us every one of those technologies bears at some point the stamp of a federal support okay. and so that's what's really cool cru crucial and cool for policymakers <laughs> to understand um is because usually if we go into an office and talk about research funding with policymakers they'll often say well this is great clearly companies have this all figured out because they're making trillions of dollars right. i mean literally the first nine companies on that list at the top of the tire tracks chart represent about a trillion dollars in in uh gdp so the um why in the world does the federal government need to be involved in in this work if the companies have it taken care of and so the chart is a really good way of showing well it's this really symbiotic sort of relationship this really long-term focus that the federal government takes care of the more kind of short-term technology transfer-ish almost even focus that the industry works on and it's formed this extraordinarily productive interplay um, that has made the U.S. a world leader in, in IT and, and lots of other really strategically important areas. Yeah. A classic example of that is Google, right? Which mm. was funded through, was that a DARPA? NSF, I think, Digital Libraries. Yeah. 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 So, Interestingly, I don't know if this is a diversion, but um, so we're part of uh, coalitions of groups like CRA that... Um, argue on behalf of science funding at the federal government. And one of these coalitions uh, actually put together some focus groups, some actual social scientists, get a whole bunch of people in the room across the country in lots of different locations and talk about the arguments that we usually make for science. One of them is the Google story, say that this small NSF grant paid off in this gigantic company called Google. And the pushback that we got from the focus groups was don't use the Google example because... <laughs> Uh, then people just think taxpayers made Larry Brind and or Sergey Brind and Larry Page rich, right? Um, and gloss over the fact that Google generates how many umpteen trillions of dollars in taxes over its its lifetime, <laughs> assuming it pays all those taxes. But um, anyway, I always thought that was interesting because we we I mean we love the Google story. the The computer science community and the computing research community, I should say. Um, we tend to be the poster child for making the case for research in town because there's a really clear chain between the fundamental research that we do in our institutions and the products that result. Every member of Congress has an iPad or an uh, iPhone. They can hold this thing in their hand that they didn't have 10 years ago that gives them all the knowledge in the world, right, <laughs> available to them at any, any time. Um, so we're often the group that all the other groups trot in first to make the case because it's much harder for like say the physics community to argue about the relevance of a higgs boson in terms of federal priority settings so we were very tangible but at the same time when we go in there we're arguing for the whole endeavor of science not okay. just not just computer science computing yeah i mean recently we make the case a lot about the social sciences and how important the social sciences are to advancement in computer science and computing research you can't solve problems in in cybersecurity, for example unless you know how people behave artificial intelligence makes it even more crucial the problems that we face there are going to require a really good understanding of ethics and understanding of incentives and right. all sorts of good stuff and that's going to come from the social sciences and even the humanities so um we try to make a rising tide floats all boats kind of case whenever we go up and talk and i think that's probably the best way to move forward it's served us well so far yeah that's it for this episode of catalyzing computing i hope you enjoyed it 
Tune in next week as I continue my interview with Peter Harsha and we discuss the impact of the federal budget sequestration on the U.S. research ecosystem and the history of the Computing Research Association. Till next time, peace.